Welcome to the new Cyber Frontier, bringing you the latest news on the local Colorado economy and initiatives that focus on the development of cybersecurity economics. You don't have to be a computer or cybersecurity expert to get plugged in. Your host, Chris Gorog, brings it straightforward, asks the tough questions, and brings the cyber world to a level of understanding for everyone. Chris is personable and opens up with our guests on the issues we all would like to see addressed. You can find us on the web at www.newcyberfrontier.com. Now join our host as he introduces the topic for today's New Cyber Frontier. Today we have a guest who is the Chief Intelligence Officer at Treadstone 71, Jeff Barden. How you doing, Jeff? Uh, very good. Uh, how are you doing today? Good. Thanks for joining. But Jeff, give us a background on yourself. Tell us what you do and what your company is about. You know, maybe not getting so technical at first, but just kind of a, an intro to what you do. Uh, I've always seemed to have a knack for languages. In high school, um, Spanish was pretty easy. and actually completed five years of Spanish by the time I was a freshman in high school. And just seemed to have a knack for that. Uh, didn't really focus on that as, as a possible career path or anything, but uh, it came about that uh, I took three years of, of Russian in college, Russian language, lit history, and did well in it. But uh, after a couple of years, uh, my father passed away, decided not to stay in, in school anymore, and kind of bummed around a little bit. But found myself finding my way back to language and went into uh, the, the Air Force and became a, a cryptologic linguist. Spent uh, a year at Defense Language Institute studying Arabic at Monterey. Uh, spent another uh, three, about three years in the Middle East, uh, performing the job in the middle 80s uh, time frame when there's a lot of activities in, in Lebanon, Libya, Egypt, back in the Reagan years. Got out, um, you know, major, major customer there or, or, or was, was the National Security Agency and had to have clearances for that. Uh, got out and completed my degree in Middle East Studies in Arabic. Also went to Middlebury College for uh, an advanced course in, in Arabic and then went back over to the Middle East and spent a year in Saudi Arabia working at uh, in computers at the international airports uh, around Saudi. Uh, amazing what access you have when you're when you're there as well when you're working in a, a position where you have uh, almost root level type access. Of course the internet was not around then at least not in the commercial space. Came back um, really got heavily into into computers and and uh, continued down that path and gosh I must have um, I, I have a master's degree in information assurance from Norwich University as well but uh, I probably have close to 400 college credits and just a bachelor's and master's degree uh, just went uh, and, and, just, and just kept taking courses a lot of them in basic Pascal Fortran Fortran C advanced C data structure systems analysis and design and found that uh, coding, even though I'm not very good at it, was just another language. Syntax, form, function, definitions. Yeah. I agree and with that. I, I've been there where, you know, I, I think that's, uh, what, about 15 or 16 languages that I've used at different points. And uh, I think that in school they should teach them as a foreign language. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think it should start very early. It should start in the, in the elementary school uh, yeah. time frame. Because what is it, about 10 years old, where the ability to lear learn a language starts to dissipate, right, at least? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. We'll be right back with the rest of today's show right after these brief messages from our sponsors. Cyber Resilience Institute helps build strong cyber communities designed to prevent members from attack. Like building a neighborhood watch, it takes coordination and a sharing community to protect our identities and valuables in the virtual world. Typically, we hear that organizations know they need to do something to protect their cyber assets, but don't know where to begin. Let Cyber Resilience Institute help your community create an action plan. Cyber Resilience Institute will build your community or business marketplace so that it is designed to support a collective cyber defense. Contact them for more information at cyberresilienceinstitute.org. So, wow, I mean, all this language, bringing it into computers and intelligence, how does that connect? Tell us about that. Yes, uh, it wasn't planned by any means. Uh, 
it just seemed to uh, to come together. I mean, it was uh, it's been it's been about twenty five thirty years in the IT space, uh-huh. and got into security. I'd say probably about ninety eight ninety nine started moving that way. So what is before we go into got into security, the general term, give us your definition of what security, what cybersecurity is. Well, back in the day, it was uh, other duties as assigned, and it was RAC F and ACF two on a on a mainframe where you just well, did hey, what are those and two access management, right? RAC F and ACF two. What are those? These were um, tool sets that managed user IDs and passwords and levels of access on the mainframe. Okay, so we're talking early big mainframes, some way to organize all the users that came in and out and secure their, their passwords. Pretty much, okay. pretty much, yeah. There was also another one called Top Secret. Those are the three tool sets used in that area. Okay. Um, then it came uh, where, well, it was firewalls, and then firewalls and antivirus, still other duties as assigned, not a separate profession or a separate uh, area. It really didn't start to come around until, I'd say, the, the mid to late 90s where people started to realize that everything we're putting on the web may start to become a problem. But so do you, uh, just kind of rewinding, I'm trying to capture your definition, your embodiment of cybersecurity. Do you see that it really is that user access to data, data management, traffic of data on networks, is that where cybersecurity is? Well, cyber or information security, however you want to call it or term it, there are different definitions around that. But when it comes to, I guess, let's go back to call it information uh, security, it really deals with information anywhere, shape, or form with respect to uh, bits and bytes, right? Uh huh. Where it sits, um, no matter where it is, if it's sensitive, you need to protect it. And that just opens up a whole uh, plethora of, of things you need to do around securing that data. Okay. And, and uh, with respect to the Internet of Things, that's just exploded, right? So it, in respect to the Internet of Things, now, now that's, that's curious you, you brought that up because if we're still kind of um, reaching for your definition of cybersecurity, the Internet of Things, is it about data? Is it about millions of devices? What's kind of the, you know, if we're looking at data and information security, where does the millions of devices in people's hands fall in? Well, devices are just the, the tool sets. It's still all about information, in my view, and information flow, and wherever that information goes. So it's storage, access, uh, sensitivity of it, transfer of it, at rest, in processing, no matter what it is. Data is the, the life's blood, I think, of, of this, this beast, this animal. Mm -hmm. we, keep adding, we keep adding new things to it, and those new things are actually new avenues for data to flow to and from and be stored upon. Okay. So, so what, it's like we're adding new organisms to the, to the, to the whole uh, environment that we're building. Yeah. So I, I'm just curious then, because at the onset of virtual machines, now you could make a million virtual machines on one machine if, you're, if you had a powerful enough system. And you can't really tell the difference between one of those virtual machines and a physical machine. No. So now if we're talking to machines distributed everywhere, virtual machines everywhere, um, what about that connection to the physical and the virtual? seems like if you're just looking at data, data at storage, data at rest, data wherever, you miss that whole how are we connecting to the real world? Well, that connection, you want to connect it to the physical environment, then you're looking at, like, staying on the theme of Internet of Things, we're still looking at smart houses in uh -huh. our vehicles, uh, embedded devices in our body. Yeah, that, I mean, those are two good ones. Vehicles Maybe. and body. I mean, something in our body, we have to make sure that we know the difference between that, that little machine and a virtual machine that's somewhere in China or somewhere overseas where we don't want things to be represented to us. And the same with our cars. If we are communicating with a car and it's driving around and our, the safety of our children are involved in us, we want to make sure that that physical is connected to the virtual. So right. I, I guess I'm, I'm coming around to your definition of you know, information security and cybersecurity being about the, the, the digital, the information storage at rest and transfer. Is it really maybe bigger that we have to connect physical and virtual? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Okay. No doubt. I mean, it's the problem with the whole the 
whole environment is that everything is built without security in mind. Still to this day, everything is built based on selling it in economics first and then figuring out security after the fact. That's why we'll have breaches. We'll have people being run off the road because their cars will be taken over. Mm -hmm. People will die because of embedded devices aren't secure and someone will access it and speed up their heart, slow it down. <laughs> and kill them. I mean, this is this will happen because the whole idea is to sell the product first and figure out how to secure it later. That's been uh, that's historical. It's proven, and it continues today by the examples we see with people taking over cars, taking over uh, smart houses. You name it. It's not going to stop because it's all about money underneath until. Until uh, someone gets hurt, right? it's all fun and games until someone gets hurt. And that's usually how it works mm -hmm. with respect to security. We are still an afterthought. We're still not built in by design. And, and we're going to continue to suffer that. So uh, I like to be a fast follower and not necessarily put everything out there immediately because I know that someone's going to suffer from it until you know, we start applying Mm -hmm. rules of protecting data, people, the so, hardware, the software, all the way through. Yeah, you brought up an inter interesting point, and I'm curious what your thoughts are. And, you know, we're going to have some breaches. We're going to have some things where somebody takes over your heart because there's some kind of uh, pacemaker in there that, that can be accessed somehow. How do we determine who's to blame when something like that happens? <laughs> it's, to me, it's got to go back to the people who are building it. But that's a combination of the hardware, the software, but it's business decisions. Mm -hmm. is where it comes down to. Is they make business decisions always thinking that applying security is going to drive the cost up. Instead, in my view, I think that security gets driven up after the fact instead of uh, built in. It's like building a car without brakes. Okay. And putting that car on the road. And then you figure out you need to have brakes, but to try and re-engineer that to put brakes on it after the fact is extremely expensive. It mm -hmm. will drive uh, like a like a tank well, it's not a good example because uh, tanks actually drive pretty nicely. <laughs> having, having been a, I was a M1 tank commander as well. Uh, okay. So picture putting the brakes on the outside where you can only have your turn radius is short and it's clunky and it uh, doesn't drive while your tires wear wrong. It doesn't stop the right way. But in mm -hmm. the meantime, uh, now it's cost too much. Um, and your car looks like crap. It runs like crap. It handles like, <laughs> like crap. I mean, it's just... That's, that's what we're doing with security, and we're blaming it on security when, in fact, we should be building in and, uh, from the beginning. So I, I think this is a problem we have is we blame things on the security aspects when we don't include it as just a matter of business, okay. a matter of build. So how do we fix this? I mean, you got any ideas about you know, oh, where geez. does it go from here? You know, I, I think we need to start holding the C-suite accountable uh, in some cases. And... The other problem I see is that uh, from a CISO perspective, having been a CISO for a number of years, CISOs are usually in a position of influencing without authority and inf influencing without the right type of money. In addition, so many CISOs today still report to the CIO, which to me is a conflict of interest. The CIO does not build an environment that follows a standard assembly line of configuration change release management much like you do on an assembly line for an automobile. Mm -hmm. They just build it and throw it out, out there and think that it costs too much to configure it the right way. So things get built the wrong way, people have inappropriate access, things changes get made without tracking it, without validating it, and so you've got systems that are built poorly, managed poorly, and the CIOs get away with it. Let me ask you this question. How many CIO certifications do you know are out there in the marketplace today? I'm not sure. Do I know of any? Any, exactly. Security people have to have CISSP, CISM, SAN certifications, GIAC, and you have to go through this to get certified. Any, any idiot can become a CIO. We'll be right back with the rest of today's show right after these brief messages from our sponsors. Since the year 2000, Bocor has had a history of being a leader in the Colorado cybersecurity community. They have served many front range customers in both government and commercial industries. 
Right now, Bocor is looking for qualified cybersecurity professionals and offering competitive salaries, comprehensive benefit packages, tuition support, and exciting career opportunities working with cutting edge technology. If this sounds like you, and you have a desire to guide our customers through the treacherous cybersecurity landscape, consider joining the Bocor team. Visit us today at www.bocor.com. That's bocor.com. B O E e-c-o-r-e dot com cyber resilience institute helps build strong cyber communities designed to prevent members from attack like building a neighborhood watch it takes coordination and a sharing community to protect our identities and valuables in the virtual world typically we hear that organizations know they need to do something to protect their cyber assets but don't know where to begin let Cyber Resilience Institute help your community create an action plan. Cyber Resilience Institute will build your community or business marketplace so that it is designed to support a collective cyber defense. Contact them for more information at cyberresilienceinstitute.org. Security people have to have CISSP, CISM, SAN certifications, GIAC, and you have to go through this to get certified. Any, any idiot can become a CIO. My view is. Well, if you I guess I would CIO, say that that most of them are pretty, pretty savvy people, but maybe yeah. they they come from more of a business background. Is that what maybe a better I, way to put it? I guess you're being more gentle than than I am. I'm pretty <laughs> jaded on that, having worked in this field. They may be savvy, but they really don't get security. They have not spent. Uh, they need to have time and service time and grade like in the military, where in order to be a CIO, you must have been a CISO for at least four or five years. And you have to have a CISSP, CISM. Well, maybe and there's a way we can we can put a training program out yes. to people that would become, that would go through the the normal train chain of, of progression that a CIO comes from, that might be more feasible instead of all the technical details, but you know the decision making needs for cybersecurity. What do you think about that? I think that that's a possible. Um, I, I just look at it. Let's let's compare this. Maybe analogizes to uh, to uh, military. Mm -hmm. If you're a second lieutenant combat arms and you work your way up through combat arms, you will probably, if you do well and you're in the right place, right time, you may become a colonel. Much less, you might even be a general. If you don't have combat arms, you never be a general. Never. Hmm. It's just not going to happen in the military. It's just it's highly, highly, highly unlikely that you would do that. So the combat arms in this case is security. If you don't have it. How can you actually represent that? And I just see it as, as that critical. Maybe it's too simplified, but I yeah, think they it, have to have their feet in the fire and learn this and understand it, and not just have the business aspects. But if you take the two, if you take another look at that same thing in the military, you could have a commanding, and I was Navy, so yep. you could have a captain of a ship who was an air wing person. They came up flying planes, and they crossed in and they learned some of the engineering, but they didn't understand it fully. And then you could have a captain of a ship that came up as an engineer and knew every nut and bolt on that ship, <clears throat> but they might have an air wing on it if it's a carrier. So both of those, you, you have people come from both directions that reach those positions of influence um, that might really not have a full breast of the other side. Somehow they've got to get, in, you know, Taking us back to IT, somehow the CIOs have to have security in their background. Okay. They just have to have it. And today, I just don't see it. I've been consulting for a number of years, a CISO for a number of years, and for the most part, uh, security plays second fiddle. You're not treated seriously. The CIOs do not have a security background. You're already put on, always put on the back burner for features and functionality, and mm -hmm. uh, that's why we continue to suffer. I've seen it. Uh, so many times in the past few years from working in the government sector, commercial sector, it has not changed. Uh, it may be more mature in financial services because of the regulatory environment and the force feeding there where they have to follow it, but there are so many other verticals out there that are so far behind, incredibly far behind when you look at them, whether it's energy and healthcare, and they're dealing with very sensitive things, whether it's uh, physical. Uh, devices such as SCADA systems mm -hmm. or physical devices that are planted in people or healthcare information and uh, personally identifiable information over. Uh, yeah. It's just amazing how these people just do not get it to this day. 
I see it over and over again. I, I fight it, I battle it when I go out and consult, and you're still not getting the funding and attention. It's always seen as um, cost too much money to do this. And then a breach comes and happens, and fingers start pointing everywhere, right? Yeah. Some of them, they're looking so, for and I do agree that, you know, we see this dynamic happening. Um, it's, it's really something that, that needs to be addressed. We hear so much that it's the education needs to happen. People need to understand. Um, how do we draw interest? And, and that's the big thing I see is, you know, other than the times when cybersecurity is in the news and there's a lot of buzz about it, the interest really feigns for, for years on end at times when it's not front and center. And then, you know, the whole industry kind of takes a dive. People get washed out. The, you know, the most talented people I see in security have told, I've heard, heard people tell me 30 years in security, one of my people, a person I trust very much told me, don't waste your life in cybersecurity. And I was like shocked that he would say that. And he's like, it goes through these, these cyclical ups and downs because it's a cost center to every organization. And it's the thing behind the scenes that they can cut. It's like, you can not take your vitamins for a couple years before your health starts to suffer. And that's what happens with cybersecurity. It's behind the scenes, and it's the first thing cut in the downturn for economics, and it goes through these cycles. So our best talent in cybersecurity isn't leading the way as far as uh, prominence and eminence in the companies. So we don't feed the interest of people to keep feeding back into the industry. And that is another view on that as well. I agree with you. Uh, there's a lot of people are going by the wayside. Uh, and a lot of people are becoming jaded out there as well. Like myself, I will never be a CISO again. I don't want to, it's just why, it's the definition of insanity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, why do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result? Until leadership changes, whether at the, the CIO level or the CEO level, CFO, CEO, whatever it is, until they are made accountable for every bit and bite that's lost, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to continue to see this until it's made financially tied to their bonus structure, mm -hmm. to their stock price somehow, we're not going to see a change because it's all about numbers. Yeah, that's so all how, they really care about. How do we do this? Do you have any ideas? How do we hold them accountability? How do we, every bit and bite, put the accountability to whoever has the, the that, that we have ownership of it? You want to say regulation, but that gets to over-regulation. Then they want to say it's self-regulated, but they won't do it. Uh -huh. um, you see financial services, uh, the large organizations are spending a lot of money on it. But some of my clients are in that space, and mm -hmm. some are very mature. Others are still fighting an uphill battle. Yeah. Uh, I'm still amazed at it. So I don't have an answer really for you that. I think it's a combination of regulation, self-regulation, of penalties, of uh, forcing board members to be accountable at the board as well as a C-suite mm -hmm. for, for the loss of data. They have to be accountable for it and there isn't anything today other than you're, you're at the top of the, the heap, right? If, if you lose something from your home, if your house is broken into, who's responsible for that security if you leave the door open, right? Are you responsible? Right, you're responsible, but when the door is left open in a corporation, the fingers point to someone else, not the C-suite. And a lot of times people don't, don't know who left the door open because there's, yes. there's no one to point the finger at. Or right. it's and, some and, developer that used to work for a company that sold them an app that they got 10 years ago, and that developer doesn't work for that company anymore. That company was bought by three other companies, and nobody right. has any accountability for that app whatsoever. Right, and the software was never documented. No one knows what's in it. Right, uh, because they didn't follow structure. Yeah. Another theory I've got too, another feeling I've got is, is probably a bias. I'm going to be 58 years old in another month or so here, and uh, I look at the fact that I've grown up with technology, uh, starting in the mainframe environments, mm -hmm. VAX, BMS machines, IBM mainframes, Amdahls, you name it, and as we have grown up with security from beginning to where we are today. Okay. Lots of students and people are coming out in the marketplace today with a degree in say information security but they don't have the 30 years of hard knocks to go with it mm -hmm. yet they're coming out and being put in positions of possible authority or or in two three years expecting to get that authority or that position management position without 
the understanding that we've suffered through for all these years and understand and see what's going on, see how things are built. Plus, they don't necessarily have the big picture of uh, or the opportunity that we've had to go through with uh, managing PCs, Max, uh, Spark, Solaris Spark stations and integrating them together with a mainframe and a Vax VMS to uh, building three-tiered architectures to yeah. uh, actually starting with uh, HTML and Gopher and Archie and Veronica and Waze databases back in the day and building it from yeah. scratch. Well, we got a lot of a lot of acronyms here, a lot of things that, you know, I know exactly what you're talking about with all these. That's why earlier Thanks. I questioned you about the Rack F and everything because we can go through acronyms all day if we're technical right. people and I have yeah. that long longevity as well. But maybe the, the culprit here is the specialization within companies where they don't, you know, you want people to be specialized at something so you, they don't get the whole breadth of everything. But we're not going to get that in no. because we're not developing these anymore. It's already happened. And we, you know, if we worked on those older systems and old, older softwares back when they were just at infancy stage and basically like command line, we know what they're doing. And we know that now these modern applications are using 10 of those things wrapped up in a package, all mm -hmm. doing something. And, and, uh, we don't look at it as one app, but nowadays you're not going to reinvent the wheel. You're not going to get kids or younger people come into the market and, and know anything other than what the latest software is because that's what they're needed by the company. Learn the late, know the latest software. That's why you're hiring you. Right. Um, right. So I think, you know, maybe there's another thing, and this is why I'm, I'm a proponent of cybersecurity as an industry, you know, bringing the things together and having a whole practice of study around it and not just the technical, but where it crosses the business. What do you think about that? Uh, I agree. Yeah. I don't disagree with you at, at all. I think it's got to be embedded in everything we do as a core component of, of business, not as a sideline. And yeah. necessarily as a specialty. You need some specialists, yes, but you secure what you own, you secure what you build, you secure what you manage as a, as a standard effort. It's got to be built into that. So maybe a way to monitor how people, or, or, I mean, I say monitor, but the self-regulator or a framework that says, how do we design the next generation of things so that we have this accountability built in? There's got to be some frameworks that are core to it. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's still a, we're still a very, in my view, very immature. Very young space. industry, huh? Very, very immature. People think it's mature. I still think it's very immature. So we started. We started the auto industry by collecting parts here and there. Now we have a very highly tuned assembly line, where things come out and they're tight and inspected along the way, and they actually run the way they're supposed to for the most part, uh, mm -hmm. sans recalls here and there. But that's become a very mature industry. We don't have an assembly line in IT. We try and call it uh, an SDLC, but then we throw agile into it because we're trying constantly trying to push new features out as quickly as possible. And then we ignore even more security around it because it doesn't fit. And then we try and fit agile into more disciplined or security into more disciplined agile. And it comes after the fact. Yeah. So somewhere along the line, it's got to be some sort of framework, some sort of governing body around critical infrastructures that ensures that security is built in from the beginning somewhere. Yeah. I'm not, I don't, I don't have the answer to it. Um, it's going to take, I think a lot of minds put together to, to try and create something around this. Yeah, there's there's actually a lot of that uh, that that thought process going into things that uh, you know we do at Cyber Resilience Institute towards what do those next generation things look like. We'll have to bring you into that sometime, Jeff. Sure. But thanks for coming on and uh, talking with us today. And uh, greatly appreciate it. And uh, when I'm out in Colorado later this summer uh, teaching a class, I'm trying to look you up. And, you know, I'll be a little ways north, but I appreciate you having me on, and then I hope we can talk again. It's been yeah. Great. And if you have any uh, any shout outs you want to give to your business, how people get a hold of you for what you do, uh, go ahead and uh, give us a, a link and some some information on how we can get a hold of you. Well, it's just uh, dreadstone71.com. And if they want to reach us, they can send an email to OSINT, O S I N T, at dreadstone71.com. All right. And thanks a lot for being on today. Have a great, great. day. hope you have enjoyed this episode of New Cyber Frontier. Remember to get involved. Often we think that someone else will handle privacy and security in the virtual world, 
but you are the only one truly in command of your virtual fate. Join our mailing list so we can keep you informed of breaking news and new releases. If you have an idea, if you have a question that you would like to hear answered, or if you want to get involved with our efforts, reach out to us at NewCyberFrontier.com. We also encourage you to visit our sponsors' links as they are the ones that really make this show possible. I want to thank each of you for supporting the show, and we look forward to seeing you back for the next episode of New Cyber Frontier.